and welcome. Thank you. Welcome to those of you who came live, and a special welcome to those who are watching worldwide on the internet. I can't, I can't tell you how many compliments that I get as I travel around from people who say that they watched this weekend, faithfully watched this weekend, in Australia, various parts of Europe, South America, all over the place. So the message that is going to be delivered here by myself and my friends is, has a worldwide impact. It's exciting. Thank you for joining us here in Santa Rosa, California, and any place that you're from. This is the McDougal Advanced Study Weekend. I can't find a better name. <laughs> I've thought. People, when we say Advanced Study Weekend, they think, oh, well, I have to be a student of the 10-day program. Or I have to have read all of Dr. McDougal's books to come to the Advanced Study Weekend. No, that's not really what it's about. It's not the basic program we teach. It's not the medical care that we give at the 10-day program. It's a weekend where people get together to bring in new ideas and discuss different points of view. You're going to hear people that, have, that hold points of view about diet other than I hold. And you'll say to yourself, why did he invite them to this weekend to speak? or maybe even different points of view on medical treatment. Why did he invite them to speak? He's not talking the McDougal message. The advanced study weekend is to bring new ideas, to bring them to the forefront, to discuss them, to challenge them. Why would I bring somebody in to tell you the same things that I tell you? I'll just tell you myself. You come to our regular 10-day program, I'll tell you what I really believe and what I really want you to know. The purpose of this weekend is to expand ourselves, advanced. This is the Advanced Study Weekend. And we have uh, guests from all over the country, very notable people, and everybody that I brought here, you may question when they first get on stage, or when you read their bio, but I brought every single person here for a reason. Because I thought, I think, I know, that they can make my life and your life better by sharing their information. Yes, I want you to react to them. Yes, I want you to challenge them. Yes, I want you to, Ask them questions, there'll be time for that, and as well as I'd like you to challenge me. This is the Advanced Study Weekend. We've been running these for, oh, twice a year for probably seven years. Very popular. We do them two times a year, usually in September and February or March. We do a couple of weekends where just the, uh, the uh, McDougal speakers, you know, our staff will talk to you about what we believe to be true. Those are called intensive weekends. We do six, seven, ten-day live-in programs where I get to be the patient's doctor. I get to be involved in your medical care. We do those six, eight times a year. We do a couple programs for businesses, like Whole Foods Market. We run a program at least once a year for Whole Foods Market employees. And then the other thing, because I'll probably forget to tell you about the things that we do during the entire weekend, the other thing we do is we go on adventure trips where you get to travel and come back healthier and thinner rather than the usual 10 pounds you gain on a seven-day cruise. So we do adventure trips a couple times a year. But this weekend is the advanced study weekend. And there are lots of friends that I have out here, people I've known for years, there's lots of people that I'd like to introduce to you also. But I just want to take a moment to introduce one person to you. And uh, if I failed to do that, then you wouldn't know the McDougal program. The McDougal program is a program from John and Mary McDougal. Mary, would you just say, stand up and say hi? <laughs> I asked her yesterday, I said, how could, you have, how could you have tolerated being married to me for 45 years? And she said, why not? <laughs> it sure has been fun. But anyway, the McDougal program is, is about what John and Mary believe. I happen to have the opportunity to talk to you about the medical aspect, the nutritional aspects. But without Mary's help, it wouldn't have worked because you'd have nothing to eat. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we just got invited to do another book. 
I said I'd never write another book again, and I really never wanted to write another book again, but they made uh, the opportunity so appealing that I had to say yes. It's not a definite. But one of the things that, about this new book that we're putting together, some of, you, some of you know it already. You already know the book because it's free on the website. It's called <clears throat> Dr. McDougall's Color Picture Book on Food Poisoning. Oh, if you haven't seen that, you ought to, it's a 66-page it's color picture book about food poisoning and how to cure it. It's free. It's on the Internet. Well, that's the book that I wanted to publish, and a company came to me. No, no sense in mentioning their name. They're one of the big publishing companies. And they said they wanted me to write a book about the healthiest diet on the planet. I said, that's not the book I want to write. I just want to put it together, a color picture book. Well, we reached a compromise, but as we were doing this, they also asked Mary to do some recipes, and this time with color pictures. And we thought about it for a minute, and I was talking to Mary, I said, you know, <clears throat> you don't have to do a lot of recipes. We only wanted maybe 24, 50 recipes. You just do your favorites. And then you go tell people about other websites, other authors, other people who also teach a low-fat vegan diet, which Mary McDougall invented in her recipes. That's the one thing. You know, there are certain things that we'll be remembered for. And as you see other cookbooks, really nice cookbooks, uh, really talented chefs, uh, one of the things I want you to think about as you look through their recipes is that prior to Mary's efforts, there were vegetarian cookbooks. There were vegan cookbooks. There were low-fat cookbooks with skinned chicken. Yes, there were. But there were no low-fat vegan cookbooks. She started it. And now you can find hundreds of websites and hundreds of books that takes us the same model. In fact, that's kind of the in thing, isn't it? It's low. Pretty soon, they may even talk about a starch-based cookbook. <laughs> That'll be really radical. We're excited to have you together with us again. <clears throat> Some of you were dragged here kicking and screaming. You know nothing about the program. You came here with, I'm sure, some concern about whether or not you were going to starve over the next three days. <laughs> Let me start by telling you what this is about. I, uh, just, just briefly. I'm a medical doctor. I'm a board-certified internist. That's a big deal. I'm an assistant professor at three medical schools. That's not a big deal. I'm licensed to practice medicine in five states. What I'm trying to tell you is I'm just a regular doctor. I'm just a real regular doctor. I'm not an alternative medicine doctor. I'm not a holistic doctor. I'm just a general doctor. That's it. I practice conservative medicine. In other words, I don't recommend things that do my patients more harm than good. I think that's reasonable. So when you come to me, you'll get less, not more. And you will get what you need if I think, if I hope, and it's my guess, that in the long run, you and I, six months from now, six years from now, will look back and say that my prescription, be it for a test for, I don't know, something, cholesterol, or blood in your stool, or some x-ray, or, or, or my treatment, some insulin or some blood pressure pill or some cholesterol medication. What my hope is, because of my conservative attitude, that you and I look back in, in, in six weeks, six months, six years and say that I did you more good than harm. That's what conservative medicine is. Because except for three things, everything that I know in medicine does harm. And some good, hopefully. You want to know what the three things that, are, that there are that only do good, right? Clean air. Recommending clean air, clean water, and clean food. Those are the only three things. Everything else, exercise, sunshine, uh, diabetic pills, mammograms, etc. They do harm. You just hope at the end of the day you'll be able to look at your doctor or you'll be able to look at your patient. You'll be able to say, you know, it was a good decision. My guess was a good one. I did you more good than harm. So what I do is conservative medicine. That's it. I'm a real regular old doctor. I have a prescription pad, et cetera. I don't prescribe supplements. I don't prescribe very many medications. 
And the other thing about myself, my practice, my profession, is that I believe that most of the sickness in the world today, what do I mean by most? About 80% in modern China and India. About 80% of the sickness in the world is due to the food, food poisoning. You can go to the... Uh, you go to the website and you can look up the lecture about food poisoning. It's due to food poisoning. It's due to food poison. Food poison, just to be general, I'm sorry I'm going to frighten a few of you, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the answer right now. The bottom line, I'm going to give you the answer. Food poison comes in two categories. It's animal foods. That's easy. You know what an animal food is. You know, something that walked, swam, or flew, or got laid in a nest. And you know, so, so it's real easy. One category of food poisons are animal foods. The other category is vegetable oil. So I believe people are sick primarily because their diet is based on animal foods and oil. And I believe the solution, as we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk to you about over the next few minutes. I'll talk to you again about it on uh, Sunday. I believe the solution is clean food. Yeah, clean food to me is Starch, like rice, which used to be 90% of the diet in Asia up until about 35 years ago. Potatoes, breads, pastas, sweet potatoes. That's clean food. That's where you get your calories from with some vegetables and fruits. But I don't want to spoil things. i got something more to say about this over the next uh, 50 minutes. So that's what you got yourself into. You got into an advanced study weekend with a leader, me, the doctor, who believes that you should get conservative medical care and you should fix food poisoning by stopping the poisons and eat the right food. Not too weird so far, is it? All right. Last time we got together was in March. What I usually do during this introduction is I try and tell you what I've been thinking about over the last six months. And so you know what I've been thinking about because you read my newsletters. I write a newsletter every month that usually comes out almost on time, but it comes out about the end of the month. And uh, I, I take at least a week and sometimes two weeks of intensive writing to do it and thinking. And I put all these ideas together in these newsletters and I send them out to you, free of charge, of course. But what I do for these advanced study weekend introductions is I try and share with you some of the more important things that I've learned more about myself and synthesized into concise newsletters that can help deliver my message to you and help you deliver that message to your friends and family. So what I'd like to do over the next couple of minutes is I'd like to talk to you about three, three of the newsletters that I've written over the last six months. And then on Sunday, I'll talk to you about a couple more of them. But there were three newsletters that I really had a lot of fun writing. I want to share with you a little bit about these three newsletters. It started in March. Of course, that was the last time we were together. It was in March, wasn't it? So it began in March. The uh, March newsletter was one where I revisited a topic that comes up almost every day in your life. I've written five newsletters about it, but I just felt like I had to write one more. And that's about vitamin D and vitamin D supplements. I just figured I had said enough because people were still asking me about whether or not they should take vitamin D, whether or not they should be worried about flunking their vitamin D test. And so I sat down in March, and I said, well, I'll try one more time to put it together. What do I really think about vitamin D? You know vitamin D, that hormone that the body makes after contact with sunlight, with ultraviolet radiation? It's a hormone. It's not really a vitamin. It uh, was referred to as a sunshine vitamin. <clears throat> vitamin D has become a popular topic, particularly over the last 20 years, because of an observation. And that is, when you look around the world, what you find is that as populations migrate away from the equator, they get fatter and sicker. Populations who exist once upon a time. You know, things have changed in the modern world. But once upon a time, people who lived closer to the equator, 
I had a very low incidence of obesity and heart disease and breast cancer. And as populations migrated to North America and South America, they got fatter and sicker. So what, once that observation was made, broadcast to the public, they said, well, what happens? What happens when you move away from the equator? Well, every school-aged child knows what happens when you move away from the equator. You get less sunshine, right? So, so the obvious thing to look at would be sunshine. That's what they should have looked at. But instead, what they looked at is they looked at the result of sunshine, which is the vitamin D levels in your blood, and what the scientists, so to speak, the businesses decided the problem was a lack of vitamin D, not a lack of sunshine. And the way we fix a lack of vitamin D is we give you pills or shots. And so as a result, over the last 20 years in particular, this wasn't common when I was a student 40 years ago. The result is that there's been a huge business created involving vitamin D. You're involved in this. I, if I asked you to raise your hands and ask you whether or not you've been checked for vitamin D, I'd bet three quarters of you would raise your hands yes. And if I ask you if you flunked the test, I bet 90% of you would raise your hands. This has become a big business, a big business involving laboratories, doctor's offices, visits, visits, and taking vitamin D supplements. The sales of vitamin D supplements have gone up 10 times in the last 10 years. This is a multi-billion dollar disease, disease business. And by doing the tests and administering the treatments to perfectly healthy people, we've committed a practice known as disease mongering. Disease mongering, and it's done by, oh, by cancer screening businesses like PSAs and mammograms and uh, by uh, blood pressure testing uh, campaigns and bone marrow density test testing campaigns. What disease monitoring does is it goes out and looks, looks at healthy people and, and tries to find disease and turns them into patients. Well, that's what the vitamin D business has done. It's went out and looked for you, asked you to check your blood, and you flunked the test. 90% of you flunked the test. And consider the financial results. All right. So we got this big, big business going uh, <clears throat> based on this observation as people get less sunlight, also reflected as a lower vitamin D level in their blood, they uh, are more sick. So the result has been treatment, treatment with vitamin D shots and pills. And the results of these treatments have been studied and various scientists have taken these studies, like in this case, they looked at a quarter million people involved in 46 major studies to see whether or not giving vitamin D helped people become healthier, have less fractures, less heart attacks, less cancer. You know, as you get further from the equator, you have more, more cancers, more heart attacks, more obesity. Well, what if you just treated that blood level with a, a pill or a shot? Would people get better? And you know what? The research consistently and this is one of the newest and largest studies done, consistently shows that giving vitamin D pills does not reduce the risk of skeletal, like fractures, and non-skeletal diseases like breast cancer, colon cancer, multiple sclerosis, diabetes. It doesn't work. It absolutely doesn't work. Yes, there's, there's an observed problem, but the resulting treatment doesn't solve the problem. So maybe we're looking at the problem from the wrong point of view. In fact, if you search, and I've done this, remember I've written now six articles on vitamin D, and I spent a week or two researching each article, I've pretty much seen what's out there. If you search, what you'll find is that vitamin D supplements have been shown to be beneficial in very limited studies, and only, only when vitamin D is used to treat elderly, institutionalized white women and you must use calcium along with the vitamin D. So what I'm saying is there's a tiny segment of the population that could be helped by vitamin D supplements, but you could do just as much good by taking grandma for a walk out in the sunshine two or three times a week in her wheelchair. That's what the research says. Okay, so we haven't been able to make the correlation between the blood level of D and the incidence of disease 
in terms of treating the blood level with a shot or a pill and making the blood level higher, the problem is, is the diseases didn't go away or get better. So how else could we look at this? Remember, as you move away from the equator, you have more obesity, more heart disease, more breast cancer, more multiple sclerosis, and so on. And as you move away from the equator, you have less sunshine. What's another way of looking at this? Maybe it's just the opposite. Maybe we have, what do they say, the tail, the, the horse before the cart? Maybe it's another point of view, and it is. It is. What research has shown is that when people get sick, when they do things that cause inflammation, including eating animal foods, meat and dairy products, increases inflammation in the body, just the act of eating these foods, and substituting plant food diet lowers inflammation. What has been discovered is just the inflammation and the sickness itself causes the vitamin D levels to go low in the blood. So variations in vitamin D worldwide are the result, are the result, not the cause of sickness. That's what the scientific research says and should be believable. Because if it wasn't that way, if you treat the low vitamin D level with a pill or shot, you'd fix the disease, right? Well, it doesn't work that way. All right, all right, here's another way to look at this from another point of view. Remember, as you move away from the equator, you have more obesity, more disease. As you move away from the equator, you have less ultraviolet light. But something else happens as you move away from the equator. People change their diets. They go from starch-based diets, more vegetarian diets, to diets with more animal foods. As you move away from the equator, food isn't available. Growing food's not available in late fall, winter, and spring. The food source becomes more dominantly animals that you, that you catch and shoot and spear. It's, it naturally happens in population. Plus, the other thing to note is that <clears throat> even today, the wealthier people in the world live further from the equator in general. The wealthier people can afford to buy more of these rich foods. That, I think, is the real explanation as to what we see in terms of geography and distribution of illness. It's not, it's not the lack of vitamin D, and certainly if it was the lack of vitamin D, the proper response would be to get more sunshine. All right, vitamin D, it's not just that it's useless, it's also harmful. Taking vitamin D shots and pills increases the risk of falls and fractures, increases the bad cholesterol, more heart disease, more prostate cancer, more Im immune suppression diseases, autoimmune diseases, gastrointestinal problems, kidney diseases, kidney stones, from the pills and the shots. Oh, let's just take it a couple of, there, there have been two major randomized trials using vitamin D. These are, these are the two studies I'm gonna show you right now. One study involved giving 300,000 units of uh, of uh, injectable vitamin D to people annually for three years in a row to see whether or not they had less fractures. These were elderly people. And what they found is those who got the real shots versus the placebo had 50% increased risk of hip and leg fractures. That's one study. There's a second study, too, from Australia. That study, they used pills, 500,000 units given in the fall raised the vitamin D levels of the wood, raised them up to about 140 nanograms per milliliter. They stayed up around 90 nanograms per milliliter, above 30, and most people's estimate is a normal vitamin D. So they raised the vitamin D levels as expected, but what they found is an increased risk of falls and 26% more fractures. So you know, it is scientifically proved that these treatments are harmful. Now, you say, well, why in the world would taking vitamin D uh, increase your risk of falls and fractures? Well, the current theory is that taking this active substance increases muscle weakness and nervous system imbalances. You know, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a medicine that has positive and negative effects. That's what science uses to explain now these surprising findings, they were surprising unless you read the research. If you read the advertisements, you get a whole different point of view. All right, so now, now you're sitting there thinking, okay, I'm one of those people, I got a low vitamin D level. I flunked my test. 
My doctor told me to take 5,000, 50,000, 10,000, whatever, units of vitamin D. You just told me it'll hurt me. I want you to remember that. Taking these pills and some of your shots, you're taking shots. If it's not, it, it's harmful, it hurts you. So I, I, I have you thinking about this now. And now the next question is, okay, what am I going to do, doctor? My blood test is low. And I live in Portland or Vancouver or Seattle, and we don't have any sunshine up there. I, I, I bet I hear that at least twice a week. People say, we have no sunshine there. Sun doesn't shine up where we live. Well, think about this. You know, people have lived in Canada and New Zealand for 15,000 years without taking vitamin D supplements. <laughs> there must be some sunshine. And with new satellite imagery and studying the ultraviolet lights, what we find is that the world is full of sunlight, even in northern and southern latitudes. In fact, there is so much sunshine up in Vancouver, up towards Alaska, that you can grow a rainforest. <laughs> and you can't supply your vitamin D levels? And then one of, the, one of the things my son, who's a doctor in Portland, points out to me is when his patients say to him, but doctor, I live in Portland. Well, I remember Portland. It used to be cloudy. Now it's sunnier than Southern California. But they will say, I live in Portland, and you can't get sunshine in Portland. Well, I looked it up. They have uh, solar panel businesses in Portland. <laughs> and, and the last time I was there, I saw a whole bunch of solar panels on people's roofs. I think there's sunshine in Portland. All right, so how much sunshine do you need? It depends on your clothing, the pollution in your area, your skin pigmentation, depends on a lot of things. But you don't need much. For a light-skinned person such as myself, five minutes exposing my hands and face at noon at a latitude of Boston, Massachusetts, is enough. That's enough sunshine to make all the vitamin E you need. But I'm a believer in sunshine. I think sunshine is good for you. I really do. I think it's a crucial aspect of life. But you can't get too much which I did when I was a young man, living on a sailboat in Hawaii. You can get too much, so you must be careful. So how much do you get? Well, I think a good way to look at it is maybe just to get your skin slightly red. You know, slight bit of inflammation. Not much, just a little bit. That'd probably be a way of looking at the maximum dose. Now, darker skin people such as Asian, three times as much as a light-skinned person like myself. Black, ten times as much. Vitamin D levels, as I mentioned to you, all kinds of variables are used as normal. Uh, some people say anything above 12 nanograms per milliliter is enough. Some people say it should be 120, or 90, whatever. Well, you've been confronted with these vitamin D levels because you've submitted to the tests. In my March newsletter, 2015, as I was finishing the newsletter, Mary says to me, but John, what they really want to know is that what vitamin D level would you as a doctor prescribe vitamin D pills? And I looked at Mary and I said, did you read what I just wrote? <laughs> I just wrote, vitamin D will increase your risk of fractures and falls and all kinds of other problems. Why would I prescribe a pill that hurt people? Yeah, but she says, that's what they want to hear. They want to hear it from you. What would you do as a doctor? What would you do? I said, they don't work and they cause harm. This is consistent. So the answer is there is no vitamin D level that I, as a conscious, <laughs> conscientious, uh, as a professional, would prescribe a pill for. I won't prescribe them. Unless maybe you're that little old elderly lady in a wheelchair that can't get outside and uh, nobody will take you for a walk, then maybe I would. But otherwise, no. All right. June came along. I wrote a letter, I wrote a newsletter called Lies and Damned Lies. Damned lies are the ones that hurt the public and the planet. You see, damned lies need to be corrected. And I wrote about a damned lie that occurred in June of 2015, just a couple of months ago. Let me, let me start, tell you how the story begins. 
Uh, I graduated from medical school in 1972. Graduated from residency in about 1978. About 1975, 76, 77, I started getting interested in diet. And I pretty much uh, knew all the things I know now by about 1977, 1978. Some of you know my story about how I used to be a plantation doctor and took care of people who lived on rice and vegetables in my plantation patients. That's how I got my eyes open. And I started reading the scientific literature and I felt like I was the Lone Ranger. I felt like nobody else knew this but me. How did nobody else know that diet had something to do with disease? In fact, all my colleagues, and I mean all my colleagues, told me diet had nothing to do with disease. Yes, they did. And by the way, they still say that. 1977, George McGovern, Democrat from South Dakota, Senator. He got together a team and he wrote the dietary goals of the United States, for the United States. See, this, this kind of started as a result of what Luther Terry did in 1964. Luther Terry was our Surgeon General in 64. What Luther Terry did I mean, I was a young man smoker back then in 1964. What Luther Terry did is he came out with the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health and told us, half of us smoked cigarettes back then, told us that smoking would kill you, give you lung cancer, based on observational studies, by the way. And what happened is the tobacco industry got slammed. Now, fewer than 20% of people smoke. Of course, they fixed that by exporting tobacco to India and China and Japan, et cetera, so they didn't lose too bad. Well, anyway, industry saw what happened to big tobacco by government action, informing the public about how dangerous dirty air is. And George McGovern and his team came out and said, it's the same thing with food. The food's killing Americans, and we should do something about it. It's the meat and dairy. We need to eat more starches and vegetables. Yes, he did. He said that in February 1977 with the dietary goals for the U.S. Well, I want to tell you, by the end of 1977, the lobbyists and the money from the industry had completely changed the dietary goals. You see, big food was not going to let happen to them what happened to big tobacco. No siree. And they fought back, even after C. Everett Cook came out in 1985 with uh, the Surgeon General's report on nutrition and health and condemned the animal foods and the lack of starches, vegetables, and fruit for sickening and fattening Americans. The food industry fought back, and they fought back, and they fought back, and they... <sighs> wouldn't you, if you owned a food business, wouldn't you fight? Isn't that what people would naturally do? See, of course they did. Well, there still were some concerned and honest people in the government. <laughs> of course there are. And back in 1980, they started something which was... A, the next step after the dietary goals for the United States, they started with the dietary guidelines for Americans back in 1980. Same message. Cut the cholesterol, cut the fat, cut the animal foods, increase the vegetables, the grains. Clearly told the public that. And every five years they published the dietary guidelines for the U.S. And every five years they came out with similar and even stronger recommendations until the current guidelines of 2010 which, by the way, will, are only days off from being changed for the 2015 guidelines. The 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans told Americans they should emphasize nutrient-dense foods and beverages, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fat-free, low-feed fat milk. So, you know, I wouldn't agree with that. Uh, what I would agree with is the, if they were just dealing with the science, they would have clearly stated in the dietary guidelines that we should be eating starches, vegetables, and fruits. That's, what, that's our current guidelines in 2010. And those dietary guidelines in 2000 went so far as to recommend the DASH diet, which is basically a vegetarian diet, the Mediterranean diet, which is a good diet in spite of the olive oil. And they even said that vegetarian and vegan diets were good for Americans in the dietary guidelines of 2010. But industry fights back. 70% of the research on nutrition done is paid for by industry. I mean, just, just look at this article that came out last month. This is a, a meta-analysis, which is mega silliness. It's just a bunch of scientists who get together and gather the studies that they want to put together to prove a point. But this was published just last month. 
dietary cholesterol and cardiovascular disease, saying that dietary cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease. Well, did you notice the red flag up there? You always have to look in the bottom left-hand corner to see who funded the study. This was funded by the egg industry. And they got all the money in the world to buy all the scientists and all the research they want. So when you hear these headlines about how everything you knew to be true is wrong, you best there's somebody's pocketbook involved. Okay, okay. So industry's been fighting back. They've been fighting back since George McGovern in 1977. They're not going to let it happen to them what happened to big tobacco. And they put money, lobbyists, Everything, everything at their disposal to winning. And they've uh, used the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, set up in 1865 by Abraham Lincoln as uh, the People's Department to, to, to help the people have good help. But it's also the USDA is the agribusiness department. See, the USDA is schizophrenic. They've got two masters to serve. They're supposed to put out dietary guidelines for us, the public, Yet they're supposed to make sure agribusiness thrives. And so industry has dominated the USDA. And the USDA and the Department of Human Health Services, they publish the dietary guidelines. And the new dietary guidelines that are coming out just in a few days, they're not out yet. We still have the 2010 dietary guidelines. The dietary guidelines for the United States for 2015, they eliminate the restriction on cholesterol, and they eliminate the restriction on the amount of fat. You can eat as much fat as you want and as much cholesterol as you want. They're in the headlines all, all the time. You wonder, how in the world did things change? I mean, since 1977, they've been 40 years, four decades, they've been telling us not to eat these things, and all of a sudden, it's okay. You can eat as much as you want. How did that happen? Only good scientists are born these days? Just stupid people before? <laughs> All right, Let, let's take a look at what they're saying. They're saying no limitation on cholesterol. Now you think cholesterol and heart disease, but what I want you to think is cholesterol is animal food. Cholesterol is synonymous with animal foods. Essentially, cholesterol only comes from animal foods, like dairy, fish, poultry, meat. So what they're saying, what they're saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, is they're saying in the new guidelines that are coming out is you can eat as many animals as you want. You can eat the oceans barren of fish if you want. You can, there's no limit anymore. The new dietary guidelines say so. So when they say no limit on cholesterol, they're saying no limit on animal food intake. Now besides, let's, let me go off track a little bit here. Besides the not just association, but the causal relationship between eating animal foods, and one marker of that is cholesterol, and heart disease and breast cancer and colon cancer. There are also other issues that may concern you. I know some of you, some of you came here because you're, you're animal rights people. I'm an animal rights person too. Didn't used to be, but my eyes have been opened. Some of you are environmentalists, and you realize that over half the greenhouse gases are produced by livestock. It is the number one controllable factor we can do to curb the destruction of planet Earth is to stop eating cholesterol, livestock. So even if they were right in the new guidelines that cholesterol didn't mean anything with heart disease, how about the factory farming? How about the fact that your children and grandchildren have no future? Okay. And they said you could eat as much fat as you want, fat. Well, you know, fat is, uh, is our largest source of calories, most concentrated source of calories. Fat is nine calories per gram. Just in terms of calorie density, it's the most, the most fattening food there is, fat is. Nine calories per gram. Sugar, pure white sugar is four calories per gram. Protein is also. Starch, like potatoes and rice, is one calorie per gram. Yeah. You know, you got to remember, a potato is not like a teaspoon of sugar. So just, just on just simple numbers, you realize that, you know, if you tell people they can limitlessly eat fat, there's going to have to be a problem. The 
fat you eat is the fat you wear. You've heard me say that a thousand times. On my epitaph <laughs> will be Dr. John McDougall says the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And there'll be a few other things there too. In fact, it'll probably have to be a cemetery wide. <laughs> The fat you eat is the fat you wear. You can go around the world and you can biopsy people's body fat and you can see what they like to eat. If you look at a population of people where they eat a lot of fish, they'll be full of uh, omega-3 fats. You look at a population of people that eats a lot of trans fats like Crisco, margarines. They'll be full of trans fats. Their body fat will be. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. It just goes like from your spoon to your hips. And now the dietary guidelines say, doesn't matter. All this simple science. Well, people have been saying for, me, for years, from my lips to my hips, isn't how the saying goes? That's all out the door with the new 2015 dietary guidelines. Oh. And other problems related to fat intake. Like the, uh, the most causatively associated factor if you had to take in and separate out different components of the diet, which you shouldn't. You should look, look at the, the fact that these are animal products full of fat and cholesterol, no fiber, full of environmental contaminants, etc. That's what you should look at. But if you're going to separate out separate, different nutrients, what you'd find is fat intake is most strongly correlated with cancers like cancers of the breast. So with the new dietary guidelines, we abandon the, the causal association of fat and obesity, the causal association with breast cancer, the greasy skin that teenagers suffer from. All right. That's the U.S., the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. They'll be out in a few days. Interesting article published in The Lancet, one of the, one of the most respected medical journals. They've looked at what's happened to the world's health, the world's health in the last 30 plus years. And what we've seen, you guys, you don't, have to, you don't have to have the Lancet to do this. You're, you're travelers. You've seen what's happened to people around the world. You, know, you used to look to Vietnam and China and India, and what you saw is trim, hardy, hardworking people. Now you go to India or China, and people are fat. You know, before 1980, fewer than 1% of the population of China had type 2 diabetes before 1980. There's virtually no obesity. Now China brags that they have the highest incidence of type 2 diabetes in the world. 12% of the population, half of them are pre-diabetic. But you know these bragging rights, uh, they have to be questioned. When I was in India last year and I told, told the, the doctors in India this, they said, nope, in India we have more type 2 diabetes. <laughs> and then there's just a report last week that in America, 12 to 14% of the people have type 2 diabetes and half are pre-diabetic. Worldwide you've seen it, worldwide you've seen it in your lifetime. Most of you, in your lifetime, you've seen the change in the personal appearance of people. If you read the science, you see they have cancer of the breast and prostate and colon, diseases that were virtually unknown in, say, Japan post-World War II. You've seen it. It's undeniable. And what's changed in the last 30 years? Well, World Health Organization tells us that meat and dairy intake has doubled worldwide particularly in developing countries. And vegetable oil consumption has doubled. And yet, the new dietary guidelines will eat as much, let you eat as much as you want. As I say, even if it was true from a health point of view, that's not important to focus on cholesterol, animal foods, and oil. There's that very important issue of global warming which I've been talking to you about for the last 10 years. If, if we really wanted to change things, I mean, we really wanted to change things. I mean, we really got serious. I mean, like, like President Modi of India or President Putin of Russia or President Obama stood up and told the public, as they're doing, they're doing, they're telling the public that the planet is frying. The hottest day in Santa Rosa, by the way, was, hottest day on record, by the way, was yesterday. If our leaders stood up and said, we've got to fix things. We've got to change to electric cars. They're saying that. We've got to, 
uh, find new sources of energy just saying that. But if they, they stood up and they said, look, there's one other thing. I mean, changing to electric cars will take us three, four decades. You know, finding uh, renewable sources of energy is going to take one, two, three decades. If they stood up and said, yes, but if we delivered the message to planet Earth that this afternoon, by just giving up the livestock, which produces over half the global warming gases, is the major destructor of the environment, if they stood up and convinced the public that this afternoon, instead of a pork chop, you could have a potato. Not only would you be healthier, you would make the biggest step we could possibly make in turning around the history for our children and grandchildren. That's why we've got to get the attention on the food, but the industry's not going to let us do that. Even, even these low-carb dieters, there's a fellow in here that I was uh, with in a debate against one of the low-carb people earlier this year. And in the debate, the low-carber, the person defending a high animal food intake, uh, had, had set the rules that all we could talk about was diet in terms of health. During the debate, the abuse of animals, the factory farming conditions that occur could not be discussed, nor could the environment be discussed in the debate. Excuse me. <laughs> all right. Anyway, all right. So here we are, August, last month. I've been wanting to write this newsletter for a long time. But you see me, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I just want to make friends every place I go. You know me. <laughs> I don't want to say anything politically incorrect or anything that would offend anybody. You know me. So I hesitated. But I decided I, had, I finally had to write this article. Uh, you, you probably realize this. I think I'm the only one that talks about a starch-centered diet. Starch is a dirty word. But until you get the fact this is a starch-centered diet, you're going to lose. You're not going to get it. You're not going to solve your health problems. You're not going to make the major contributions you want. I know some of you are trying. I know some of you in this room right now are not going to like what I have to say over the next... 10 minutes, but I have to say it. <laughs> you've decided to give up animal products. Maybe, maybe you've even decided to give up vegetable oils because you got this part of the message. And what you've decided to eat instead, because you don't want to eat starch. Everybody knows starches are fattening. That's why there's so many fat people in China before 1980. So they don't want to make that uh, terrible dietary mistake of eating potatoes and rice and bread, the staff of life. So what they're going to do, what they're going to do is many of my vegetarian friends, vegan friends, they're going to switch to nutrient-dense, non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. Green, yellow, and red vegetables. Green, yellow, red, and purple vegetables. That's what they're going to do. And then the reason they're going to do that is because they believe starches are fattening, which is complete nonsense. It's the only key to getting your health back and your weight. They're going to switch to these foods because they're so nutrient-dense. They're so high in phytochemicals. They're going to fight against cancer. And taking these phytonutrients, all of these vitamins and minerals and other substances made by plants, they're going to ward off these horrible diseases. That's what people believe. That's why they eat all these nutrient-dense, particularly cruciferous vegetables, to get all these special concentrated nutrients. I just had to write about this. <laughs> the 20th century was the golden age of nutrition. During the 20th century, we discovered protein, vitamins, minerals, fats. Scientists discovered these basic elements of food. And one of the results of discovering all these elements of food is uh, scientists, well-intentioned, medical doctors, well-intentioned, industry, uh, very interested in the profit margin. They decided what the, we will do to fight off cancer and heart disease, etc., is to take supplements 
like antioxidants, vitamin E to prevent heart disease, and beta carotene to prevent cancer. So we just take these vitamin pills, pills along with our pork chops and pizza. And so the vitamin pill businesses boomed. Yes, they did. And they still are, by the way. Boomed. Well, you know, naturally inquisitive scientists uh, thought that they ought to study the effects of taking all these vitamin pills. And the effects of taking pills with concentrated isolated nutrients is clear and consistent. They do no good, worse yet, as a summary statement, they increase your risk of cancer, heart disease, and death by 20 to 30 percent. The Cochrane Collaboration came out and said that for every one million multivitamin, you know the multivitamins, the ones that your mom used to give you along with your orange juice in the morning? For every one million one-a-day multivitamin supplement users, there'll be an extra 9,000 deaths. That's what Cochrane says. So, this is what Cochrane still says. This is an article just published last month. Another review of uh, supplements and what they show, the conclusions say, we found no evidence to support antioxidant supplements for primary or secondary prevention of illness. Beta carotene and vitamin E seem to increase mortality. This is not a minor opinion, ladies and gentlemen. This is what the research says. These supplements are dangerous, not just a waste of your money. Okay. Well, anyway, so we went through this vitamin pill rage where we were going to take these, these micronutrients, these nutrient-dense substances to ward off disease. And it's proved unquestionably to have been a failure, a costly failure, not just in terms of money, but in terms of people's lives. Well, you guys remember Watson and Crick? Discoverers of the, the helix DNA. Oh, come on, Watson and Crick. James Watson. James Watson, 84 years old, he wrote this really interesting paper. It's free access, you can read it. Where he looked at this whole thing, James Watson did. Watson and Crick, DNA, pretty famous. Okay, so Watson, he wrote this uh, phenomenal criticism about the attitude of taking these nutrient dense substances to ward off disease. And in one of his paragraphs, he says something that helps us transition to the topic. He says blueberries best be eaten because they taste good. Not because their consumption will lead to less cancer. And you may want to eat blueberries for that reason. I don't think kale tastes good, do you? Okay, all right, let's get back to the topic. Uh, the cruciferous vegetables are nutrient-dense foods that people are eating with the same attitude that they eat vitamins with, vitamin pills with. Yes, they do, my vegetarian, vegan friends. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay. Well, let me tell you the impracticality of this. I meet lots of people who are on these nutrient-dense diets, which means they minimize starch, but they eat lots of kale and broccoli and cauliflower, et cetera. And what they tell me is they tell me I'm starving to death. Well, of course you're starving to death. These foods are so bulky, so low in calories, that like, for example, to get 1,500 calories, which probably everybody requires in this room, you'd have to eat 11 pounds of kale a day, cooked. <laughs> You'd have to eat 14 pounds of cabbage or 10 pounds of broccoli. You just don't have time <laughs> or the patience. And that's why one of the major complaints I hear from people who go this route, well-intentioned. They want to avoid the animal foods for a variety of reasons. They want to be healthier and they know plants are the key. But they make this vital mistake of going for, as a primary part of their diet, these non-starchy, greedy, yellow vegetables. And they just can't do it. It is physically impossible to sustain. That's been my experience. And then what they do is they eat nuts. Because <laughs> they're starving. Oh, boy. They don't go there. <laughs> now, along with, uh, with having few calories in the broccoli, cauliflower, kale, etc., these nutrient-dense foods are nutrient-dense. They're very dense in lots of nutrients including protein. If you were going to eat enough calories to meet your calorie, 
enough of these foods to meet your calorie intake, you'd be taking in four times more protein than you need in cabbage. In kale, you'd be taking in five times more protein than you need. And with broccoli, you'd be taking in seven times more protein than you need. Say you need a little protein, about 5% of your calories. Say you're taking foods that are 25, 35, 45% protein. What happens to that extra protein? Where does it go? Must do something, doesn't disappear. Where does it go? What does it do? Well, it does some serious things, which are real problems. That excess protein builds up in the blood as nitrogenous substances, which are particularly important with people who have kidney or liver failure, because that raises their blood urea nitrogen, which puts them into kidney and liver failure, and all kinds of sickness, but the average person also. In our studies of our patients here, we see a drop in these nitrogenous products when they, of course, get off the American diet, which means they have less burden on their livers and kidneys. The other thing all this extra protein does is it causes bone loss. Yes, it does. Now, we're talking about vegetable protein here. You've heard my lectures about animal protein and the acidity causing bone loss. Well, excess vegetable protein also causes mineral loss from the body. For example, this study by David Jenkins, who was one of the speakers at one of our advanced study weekend. They did a study on the effect of vegetable protein on mineral balance and the loss of calcium in the urine. And they found when they doubled the amount of vegetable protein, they doubled the amount of calcium loss. These non-starchy vegetables put a serious burden on your body. The body has to do something with these excess nutrients. They don't just disappear. They have to be processed. And in the processing, the body is burdened. All right. Maybe I've not got your attention yet, but I'll try. How about this problem? Cost. Just a thousand calories. Just look at a thousand calories. You've got to feed you and your family. And you've gotten off the meat and the dairy and the eggs, which are expensive, but you've gone to even more expensive, nutrient dense, cruciferous or non cruciferous, green, yellow, red, and purple, and orange vegetables, right? What is the cost in terms of out of pocket to get a thousand calories of potatoes or rice cost 20 cents? To get 1,000 calories from broccoli, kale, or cauliflower costs $3. It's impractical. It's impossible. Planet Earth couldn't support it. You couldn't support the world population if the world got the message that they were supposed to be eating all these nutrient-dense foods. You couldn't grow enough of these non-starchy vegetables to feed the planet. But you can grow enough rice and potatoes. All right, one more thing about these uh, worshipped vegetables. Last time we were together, we talked about the scandal of arsenic and rice. Consumers Report has these, this big story about how you shouldn't eat rice because it's full of arsenic. And you're all asking me what to do. What do you do? We discussed this last time. You want to eat clean rice, not rice grown in polluted soil, soil polluted with arsenic from previous farming. That would be good. But the whole world is upset about rice because of arsenic. How about the cruciferous vegetables? They're known as hyperaccumulators. They are particularly aggressive at sucking toxic elements out of the ground and accumulating them in their parts. Thallium for example, is one that has been of great concern. Thallium, a toxic substance, element 81, which is kind of a bluish substance. The scientific papers are written about how different cruciferous plants are so efficient at sucking thallium out of the soil and putting it in your food. Oh, by the way, those blue things, they're broccoli seeds. They're not thallium molecules. So uh, that's another thing you're getting by eating these large amounts of these uh, nutrient-dense foods, is you're getting a, a tremendous amount of heavy metal poisoning from, from the soils. Oh, okay. So why did I write this newsletter in 
last month in August, is because Scientific American came out with an interesting article about these nutrient dense foods. Fun article to read, it's open access, you can get it on the internet. It's about, there are substances in broccoli, kale, cauliflower, et cetera, that ha seem to have some particularly, particular benefit in terms of anti-cancer and anti-heart disease. And this article talked about why these substances are in the plants. They're in the plants because the plants made them for their own self-defense. As the authors say, the health benefits of fruits and vegetables are an inadvertent offshoot of eon-long wars waged by plants against critters, insects. You see, the plants make these substances which we identify as being beneficial, healthy, and they may be, they are, I will say they are. They made them for their own purposes as insecticides. That may be why broccoli and kale and cauliflower taste so bitter. I think that is. Because you're eating plant. Plant synthesized insecticides. <laughs> oh boy. All right. So what are you supposed to do? What do I weigh? I think you should eat some of these green and yellow vegetables. But those of you who read my colored picture book on food poisoning and how to cure it by eating beans, corn, potatoes, and rice, you know that what I want you to do is I want you to get most of your food from starch. 60% minimal, 70%, mm, yeah, at least. Probably 80%, maybe 90% like the Asians used to do from rice, from starch. You love starch. Starch is comfort food. You love bread. There's a reason you love pasta and sweet potatoes and potatoes. That's your food. And until you figure that out, you're going to struggle in all kinds of ways. So what I recommend is a starch-based diet. Yeah, you can have some of these non-starchy vegetables. One of the surprising things, in fact, it's a gentleman that is in this room. When he first came here and he heard about the starch-based McDougal diet, he thought that at 6 o'clock, which is about two minutes away, that when he walked in the dining room, all he would see was potatoes. <laughs> or rice. And there'd be no green and yellow vegetables. Big surprise. We use these green and yellow vegetables for their nutrients, for their special insecticides synthesized by plants that prevent cancer, for their color, for the flavor, for the texture, for the interest. Yes, use non-starchy green and yellow vegetables as side dishes. They're an important part of the diet for a variety of reasons. But if you're still in the fallacy of thinking that you're supposed to live on these non-starchy foods, uh, you need to get over this. And you can add a few fruits and vegetables, a few, veg a few fruits to your diet too. That's the kind of diet that I teach, a starch-based diet with some fruits and some non-starchy green and yellow vegetables. And that's the kind of diet that people have been living on maybe for two and a half million years, certainly for 100,000 years, certainly for 30 or 40,000 years. Certainly, in all the history that you know, you know that people from around the world have centered their diet not around broccoli. The Aztecs and the Mayans aren't known as the people of the cauliflower. <laughs> and when you think of China, you don't think of kale. You see, the, the human diet is a starch-based diet, always has been, always will be with the addition of some fruits and vegetables. So that's what I've been doing the last six months as I've been thinking about these three important topics and a couple more I'll talk to you about on Sunday. I hope you enjoy the weekend. We're going to do the best we can to make this the best advanced study weekend we've ever had. And that's a big, a big statement. That's a big order to fill because we've had some phenomenal weekends. But with the guest speakers we have, with a phenomenal audience that uh, traveled long distance at great inconvenience and expense to come and be with us, we're going to make all the effort we can to make this the best advanced study weekend that we've ever put together. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy dinner. <laughs>